In September 2003, the Cheshire Constabulary took a telephone call from a concerned teacher about a missing teenage girl. From here began one of the most complex and lengthy inquiries the Cheshire Constabulary has dealt with. Shafid Ahmed was a 17-year-old girl with a bright future before her. As the police missing persons inquiry began, it became clear that not only her former teachers, but also her school friends were deeply concerned about where she might be and what had happened to her. The police inquiry was extensive, spanning the length and breadth of the country, but no information was found to provide any reassurance that Shafila was alive. Police inquiries quickly shifted from a missing person inquiry to a criminal investigation. Our worst fears were confirmed in February 2004 when decomposed remains found by the banks of the River Kent in Cumbria were found to be all that remained of Shafila's body and a murder inquiry was launched. That murder inquiry spanned a further six years with many lines of inquiry and thousands of actions undertaken by the police in an attempt to find how Shafila had met her death and why. During that period, the Cumbrian coroner held an inquest into Shafila's death, returning a verdict of unlawful killing. Cheshire Constabulary never closed the file on Shafila Ahmed. It is the role of the police to consider the facts as we have them, to follow up every line of inquiry, every piece of information. The criminal investigation into the disappearance and murder of Shafila Ahmed did exactly that, and were conducted throughout with impartiality, integrity and professionalism. From very early on, on through talking to those Shafila confided in, police began to have real concerns about her home environment. She had run away several times, had the marks of physical abuse, had self-harmed and clearly feared the control her parents sought to impose upon her. Over the years, many people have asked me, is this a so-called honour killing? For me, this is a simple case of murder. Domestic abuse by two parents towards the children. Domestic abuse is sadly something which the police have to deal with too often. It transcends culture, class, race and religion. There is always a trigger. In the case of Shafila, the abuse she suffered is motivated by her parents' <coughs> desire to control her, to make her conform to their interpretation of Pakistani culture. They try to control her, to force her into marriage and to prevent her from expressing herself. When this failed, they murdered her, a vile and disgraceful act against their own daughter, a murder, someone they should have been very proud of. In 2010, I took over the investigation into the murder of Shafili Ahmed, an offence that took away a bright, intelligent and strongly ambitious teenager that had so much to live for. She had wanted to progress into law as a barrister, and at the age of 26, the age she would be now, she could well have been practising law for the last three years. It was clear to me that the tragedy of this case was still very vivid in the minds of many people in the constabulary. By 2005, Superintendent Jones and his team had compiled a comprehensive file of evidence. This later informed the coroner and his verdict of unlawful killing. However, a QC, having reviewed the evidence file, found that the case fell just short of the threshold for criminal charges of murder. In 2010, by her own admission, Alicia Ahmed was involved in a robbery committed at the home of her parents. While in custody, as officers spoke with her, seven years of silence fell away. Alicia found the courage to tell the truth about her sister's death. For the first time, officers understood fully the terrible sequence of events which took place in the Ahmed family home on the night of Thursday the 11th of September 2003. Even more courage was required for Alicia to stand up in court. In the presence of the parents who had murdered her sister and the siblings who had stood by in horror and watched and tell the truth again. As she recounted Shafili's last moments to the court, we caught a glimpse of the transfixed and terrified 12-year-old that she was then. Her evidence against the parents was compelling and disturbing. 
I know the giving of this evidence has had a significant impact on her life. Her courage has been driven by her determination to achieve justice for Shifilia. This trial has not stood on Alicia Ahmed's evidence alone, but it has progressed to justice because of it. Many witnesses have shown a huge amount of courage. Friends, teachers and other professionals have been called to the court by the prosecution team and it has been clear to see how raw and emotional providing evidence of Shafili's domestic abuse and eventual murder has been for them. During the trial itself, other witnesses were influenced by Alicia Ahmed's account and this led to further evidence coming to light as the trial progressed. I am convinced that this has influenced Fazana Ahmed's change of defence statement. The police Crown Prosecution Service team responsible for the criminal investigation and trial have demonstrated professionalism and commitment. However, it is those witnesses who have stood up for Shafilia and for justice who have made today's verdict possible. It's significant that on the screen behind me there's a picture of Shafilia. Shafilia's parents have today been convicted of her murder, a brutal murder that was the culmination of years of sustained abuse. Shafilia and the tragic circumstances of her death must be the focus of all our thoughts today. Shafilia was born on the 14th of July, 1986, was 17 when she died. Her 26th birthday fell during the course of this trial. And had her dreams played out in the way that she'd hoped, she would be a lawyer. Despite the best efforts of the defendants to derail the investigation into her death by subverting witnesses, including their own children, Cheshire Police have worked tirelessly for nearly nine years gathering <coughs> evidence, and today's result is a tribute to their efforts. I also give heartfelt thanks to Andrew Edis, Queen's Counsel, and Henry Riding, Junior Counsel, for presenting that evidence to the jury in such a compelling way, and to the jury for their diligent attention that they've given to the evidence over 10 weeks. Back in 2005, the Crown Prosecution Service considered a substantial file of evidence presented by Cheshire Police. The view then was that that evidence fell just short of that required to mount a prosecution. And it was clear then that what was required was for a member of the Ahmed family to break ranks and tell the truth about what had happened to Shafilia. And as you know, that happened in 2010 when Alicia Ahmed, Shafilia's younger sister, gave her statement describing the violent death of Shafilia at the hands of the defendants. DCI Anchors has made reference to Alicia, and I endorse all that he has said. Today's result is a testament to her courage and fortitude over the last two years. Alicia's disclosures and her agreement to be a witness were a turning point in the investigation. And this is the message that needs to come out of the case. The Crown Prosecution Service has recently focused on increasing the number of convictions for violence against women and girls. With some success, but we want to do better. There are many possible descriptions that can be applied to the violence inflicted on Shafilia. Child abuse, domestic violence, so-called honor-based violence, being just three of those. However you choose to characterize it, we as a prosecution service are committed to convicting perpetrators like Iftikhar and Fazana Ahmed. But to do that, we need witnesses to come forward. Such violence by its nature happens behind closed doors. We need courageous victims and other family members to come forward and give evidence as happened in this case. And if people do come forward, this trial has shown that the criminal justice system will not let you down. The word shame has been heard many times during the course of this trial in at least three languages. And the evidence has shown that cultural factors were latterly at the heart of the Ahmed's abuse of Shafilia. Why did they abuse Shafilia? Why did they kill her? 
Put simply, it was because she challenged their regime and refused to conform to their expectations. She wanted to choose how she lived her life and who she married, choices that are fundamental freedoms for any citizen of the United Kingdom. Violence against women and girls occurs in all communities and the causes vary. Whatever the cause, we're committed to prosecuting those responsible. Sadly, today, in this country, there will be other victims in a similar predicament to Shafelia. And my final words to those victims and to members of their family and friends who are witnesses to that suffering are this. Think of Shafelia Ahmed. Follow the courageous example of Alicia Ahmed. Come forward, seek help, contact the police, make a statement, put your faith in the criminal justice system, and make sure that Shafelia didn't die in vain. Opportunity for questions. Mr. Jones, from the outset, it seems clear that the police have never believed Iftikhar and Fazana Ahmed. Uh, repeated protestations of their innocence. They even hijacked one of your press conferences to turn up and say that you should be looking elsewhere. What is it about them that, from the very beginning, you just didn't believe what they were telling you? I think there's a, a large amount of evidence that's been heard within the court over the last few weeks that points the finger directly towards them, hence the, their conviction. But if you think about it, Shafelia wasn't reported missing by the Ahmeds. She was reported missing by someone who cared for her, by her teacher. And that starts the suspicion in my mind that um, they were responsible. And you follow the evidence, you know, there, there was lots of material provided to the police. It was the, the investigation went all over the country in terms of uh, people contacting us, sightings of Shafili, but everything came back to uh, that house and her parents. And obviously when Alicia comes forward, that makes it even narrower. But I think it's obvious to everyone that uh, if, if a child goes missing, you do what you can to find her, and they didn't do that. And that's You've faced a wall of silence, haven't you, from the family and from the wider community? We've, I think it'd be unfair to say the wider community because we've had lots of support right across the country for our investigation. Uh, we haven't had many walls of silence at all. What we've had are, are very challenging environments and, and fingers pointed towards is about stereotyping that family, but not a wall of silence. Mr Jones, uh, Nick Martin from Sky News. Um, if the car and Ahmed are now on their way to prison. Is that the end of this story or are you looking at other prosecutions? From? Can I pass that question to DCI anchors please? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I think everybody's aware that this trial's probably had more twists, turns and shocks and surprises than, than, than any I can remember. I think it's fair to say that there is a lot of evidence that's been heard, some that uh, doesn't coincide with other evidence given. given We've got to take stock of where we are. We've just had a verdict less than less than an hour ago. I think it's a case of stepping back, assessing the evidence that's there, seeing whether there is a, a, a realistic investigation to be had. Is it proportionate? Is it appropriate? And then we'll make some decisions when we've had time to think about it. But from what you know of this case, and you, Mr John, fresh evidence has emerged during the course of this trial, hasn't it? Lots of fresh evidence, um, and everybody be aware of those witnesses that were called that weren't planned when we first started. But uh, it, it's clear that that there are lots of things in play here. Uh, we've given and seen evidence that shows that there's a, a huge amount of control and um, abuse that's been uh, levied out by the the Ahmeds, the parents. We've got to take stock of the evidence we've heard before we start making any decisions on where we go from here. Okay, another question over the back there. Uh, Mr. Jones, Matt Brindley, ITV News. Um, you presume we spent a fair amount of time with the Ahmeds. Can you give us some idea of the, the kind of mindset throughout this investigation? Were they, were they arrogant? Do you think they thought they were untouchable by the police? I didn't contact them much. Obviously, we have family liaison officers in place to support initially. Uh, the times I did meet them, they were polite and uh, very unchallenging, I would describe them as. But as the investigation progressed and as the evidence built, particularly once we found Shafila's body, their attitude changed and they became aggressive. They, they, in their own minds, thought they could use the media to, to point the finger elsewhere, as we've heard in court. But 
behind it all, we knew within that house there was torture, there was domestic abuse. So whatever they were like to me face to face, I knew the truth behind that because I'd heard them. Okay, Lady in front. Um, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Shadwoods, Ethan Keel, and Arthur, you said there that you knew the truth personally, and, and you have a nine-year quest for that truth. How do you feel sat there today on the day that your husband, justice for Shafilia? I think that's what we need to concentrate on, is Shafilia, and that they've murdered Shafilia, and that's the case. And that's the important issue, not what they're like, it's what's happened to her. But these cases are, when you start an investigation like this, as you did, from the discovery of Shafilia's body on the, in the River Kent, um, nobody could have imagined what the, the last nine years would have been like. So in that sense, it surely is one of the most remarkable cases that you've worked on. Thankfully, I've not worked on many murders and inquiries. I've, I've been involved in several and led several. But this, you know, when you talk to people who have been in the justice system around these sort of big cases before and the twists and turns, the drama. From day one, Shafilia didn't want this sort of life. Shafilia wanted to be a lawyer and wanted her privacy, I'm sure. Uh, and it's, it's so sad, really, that so much has gone on around Shafilia and her murder when that shouldn't have happened. She should be free and living a happy life now. Gentlemen from Radio. Andrew from Heart Radio. Um, how hard is it to build a su successful case when you're taking just the word of a, a girl who was 12 at the time and you're taking a, a statement from seven years on? I think, by all means, come in, Grant. But uh, I think it's clear to say, as, a, as I mentioned earlier, there was, there was a, a really strong, substantial case and um, that, that led the... Um, the coroner at the time to say that this is unlawful killing. So it, it is, it's clear that there's a really strong case and that case, whilst not sufficient to take to, to, to criminal proceedings, pointed the finger largely at that house and the parents that lived in that house. Um, so when you then add what is essentially an eyewitness, uh, then it, it takes it well above that threshold. There are, as I pointed out, um, some things that came with Alicia, it all came out of a robbery allegation, which he later admitted. So that was complicated as well, but it's quite clear that the, there is an abundance of evidence. You know, it was an overwhelming case, and that's what was put before the court. Okay, Claire from here. Claire, Hannah, and my offensive and Now, we say it, it is about Shafiri, she's a victim of this book. The other four children, they're all, it's a family being destroyed, the four children are victims as well. It's tragic, best way to describe it. It's touched across, not only within the household, but those that cared for Shafilia. We've heard evidence, you know, from Melissa, from Joe Code, from people who are very close who really did care for Shafilia. The impact on those, you know, it's our job to, to investigate, but it's our job, it's their lives. Okay, Anne. I'm Anne from Granada Television. Um, does Alicia know about the verdict and how she been since she gave evidence what's her reaction to her parents being jailed um it'd be very very difficult to actually equate um during her evidence it was quite clear that uh, alicia's feelings were, were torn and she still cares for her parents I, I can't sit here and try and explain that that that's what she said to the court um so in relation to uh, sentencing, I'm sure she probably is aware, certainly is uh, from, from the media, etc. How she's going to respond, we're going to have to see over the next few days. I'm sure it's going to sink in and take some time to sink in. But none of you have spoken to her? Well, since sentencing, I haven't done. Okay, back uh, One of the pivotal moments in this trial was Fazana Ahmed's change of tack. Um, given what you'd heard from Alicia, given what you knew about the evidence. What did you make when you first heard she was trying to pin it on her husband? Well, it, it was um, a huge surprise. Um, the Wednesday evening there had been a, a, a bail refusal and almost immediately the next morning there was a, a change of stance. Um, what the rationale from that uh, was, I don't know, but I can form my own opinions. It coincided with the bail refusal. Um, and if you look at it, it is um, 
it's supporting evidence that what Alicia had given us, albeit she did, she made out Alicia was a liar. It was clearly supporting evidence that something tragic had gone on that la that night, and that's exactly what Alicia had told us. She was uh, clearly providing what she thought was the best route for her. Unfortunately, the jury didn't accept that. Yes, I know. Um, just on a similar vein to that. Um, the circumstances of that kind of change of heart. Did you have any um, reason to believe that they were that they were actually going to Pakistan? Did you have any evidence they'd been buying tickets, or um, you know, what was the kind of the, the, the drive behind that that decision to um, hold it there? Um, the, the bail in, in relation to uh, Fazana on that Wednesday night had already uh, been taken away. She, she was in custody already at that time. But was there a back, was there a reason, I mean, had you, had you had received some information that you were worried that they were about to flee, or, you know, what was the, the, the driver behind No, uh, I think uh, the application that was made uh, was that because all the witnesses from the, the prosecution team had now concluded, then she should be enabled to uh, have bail. And um, the judge decided that A, because there was a risk of interfering with witnesses, and B, there was also a flight risk because of the change in the, the case, uh, the bail was refused. But in, in answer to your question direct, did we have any evidence that they were flying to Pakistan? No, we did not. And on a, on a, you talked about the kind of bravery of the witnesses. Can you give us a bit of a, an idea of the circumstances of how Shaneen Manir's evidence came to light? Um, yeah, quite quite easy. Sh Shaheen had, had uh, been very close friends with Mevish, and uh, they would got a pact with one another, and that pact was the, one of the strongest you can have, and that's between two friends. And they they both, you know, agreed that nothing would ever come forward. But when she heard the evidence that was uh, put. A, across by the media following Alicia's evidence, uh, she felt compelled. She had to do something. Purely on reading what she'd read exactly. the or seen on her. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. One here in the back. You've touched upon this, you've alluded to it, and it's a sensitive matter, but it's clear that you've had one version of events from Alicia and another version of events in court on oath from other people within the family. Is that something which you are going to be looking at either as the CPS or the police? Because someone obviously has not been telling the truth. Where the hell are you want to? Well, I think DCI Ancus has all already dealt with that. Um, but obviously, once today is over, um, we will be taking stock. And, uh, so we're just going to take you away from that press conference now in uh, Chester. You will have observed the comments made by both the police and the CPS about the courage of Shafilia's sister, Alicia, and that wider discussion about courageous victims and how important it is in cases like this for other family members to come forward. Iftikhar Ahmed, his wife, Fazana, jailed for life, minimum of 25 years for the murder of their daughter, Shafilia.